Woods by Chris Crawford. My girlfriend Amy disappeared last week. She went on a camping trip in the woods with her high school girlfriends as part of their annual tradition. They were supposed to come back Sunday evening, but they never did. I reached out to Amy's family and the families of the girls through Facebook, and then I met them at the ranger station outside of the woods where they were camping. For two straight days, we searched and found nothing. The police were unable to track their phones because they were turned off. They had no choice but to call off the search. The police urged us to return home and they would continue to look for them. Although with no evidence the girls had ever been there in the first place, they weren't very hopeful. Devastated, we all went home. Unable to return to any sense of normality, I drank myself to sleep that night in front of my computer, going through the photos and videos of us together. I refused to believe this was real, and this was just some sick nightmare that I would eventually wake up from. I woke up to my phone vibrating in my pocket, but I missed the call. I had a voicemail from Amy. I tried to call her phone back six times before I listened to the voicemail. Pick up! Please pick up! I pleaded to the open air but to no avail. I finally played the voicemail, praying that she would say that they got lost or went somewhere else. The message crackled and it was full of static. I could hear the wind rumbling in the background and a faint voice masked by the howls. I didn't notice the voice until the third time I played back the message. I scrambled through my drawers to find an aux cable and hooked my phone up to my computer speakers and turned up the volume. Three five eight four eight north seven nine four eight six seven west. Help me, help me, help me. I raced back down to the ranger's station near the woods and banged on the front door for them to open up. The only two officers on duty were the ones who led the search party. My lungs burned and I fought for air while I tried not to vomit and told them the story about the voicemail. They tried again to triangulate the position of her cell phone, and it was a perfect match. The coordinates from the voicemail was exactly where the cell phone was at that moment. We went to the location in one of the cruisers from the station, but had to leave the vehicle about half a mile from where the ping was coming from. We rushed to the site, but there was nothing there. It was a small clearing with what looked like scorch marks in the center and ashes from a recent fire. Amy, Amy. Amy! I screamed until I thought I was going to pass out. One of the officers told me to quiet down so that he could listen. There was a rustling in the distance and something was moving out there. I went with him to investigate while the other officers stayed behind in the clearing as backup. Someone had obviously been out there recently. We made our way through a thick path of trees into another clearing. And there it was. It was Amy's car. How did this even get out here? The officer said while surveying the dense brush on all sides. There were no tire marks or indentations on the forest floor. He became ominous of what we would find in the car and suggested that it would be better for him to check out the trunk. I went to the driver's side and popped the trunk. Inside the vehicle, nothing looked out of place. I rifled through the glove box and pulled receipts out of the cup holders. At the bottom of the cup holder, I found the promise ring I gave Amy six months ago. I broke down and started sobbing. It finally hit me that this was really happening. I yelled back to the officer to see if he had found anything, but there was no response. I got out of the vehicle and walked back to the trunk, and he was gone. I yelled again, and still no response. I looked in the trunk, and it was empty. I started to make my way back to the clearing and stopped when I felt rain hitting the back of my neck. Drip, drip, drip. Within a few seconds, it was pouring down. Though, something was wrong. It was warm. I looked up as the warm liquid ran down my face. It wasn't raining. It was blood. I stared in absolute terror as the officer hung in the trees above me, swaying back and forth as the blood fell from his gutted corpse. His insides were strung all over the trees in a sick, 
almost Christmas-like display. I shrieked as I turned to flee, tripping over my own feet and falling on my face. I scrambled back to my feet and fled back towards the clearing, screaming for the other officer. I made it back to the clearing and the other officer was lying in the center, gutted, just like the first. Intestines strung up in the trees above. I fell to my knees. I was done for. I sobbed and waited for whatever did this to them to take me next. I'm right here. Just do it. Just do it. What are you waiting for? I screamed. I pulled out my cell phone to record my last message to the world. Then I noticed the eyes. Just off in the trees around the clearing, there were red, beady eyes. Watching. Waiting. I couldn't take it any longer. I dropped my phone and started running. I ran as fast as my feet could take me for what seemed like hours until I saw the police cruiser that we came in. The keys were still in it. I drove back to the station, the whole time staring at the fresh blood still smeared on my face in the rearview mirror. They kept me for three days in holding. I told the story a hundred times. They didn't believe me. They found Amy's car, but never found the bodies, so they had to let me go. This morning, I woke up with a voicemail on my phone. A new one. It was from Amy. Well, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this. This is only the beginning of the story. There's quite a bit more to it. If you've enjoyed it, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already so that you'll be notified when the next part comes out. And as always, thank you for listening.